incredible to be here. I have never had my mind blown more in visiting any facility or organization as I have coming to UFM. And if there was ever a university that I was going to make, this would be it. And so how exciting it was for me to find my tribe, to find those who resonate with the values that I have, and such an honor to be here. I work at a robotics company, and we do autonomous vehicles, and those include the mining industry. There is such a labor shortage right now in mining that there are trucks parked where they can't get drivers. And showing here some vehicles running in the Ukraine and in Australia, I was just at this mine site, it was 47 degrees Celsius. So toasty warm, not an ideal place to work. And so now those people who were driving trucks there have been retrained and now they can run our system back in their homes from Perth like a video game from 1300 kilometers away. And they no longer have to fly two weeks away from their family and stay in a camp. Construction, same thing, 450,000 jobs are open in the United States, they cannot get the help. In Japan, for the vehicles like this one, the average age of the operators is 70 years old, seven zero. They cannot get the youth of today to drive the equipment in a circle, 16 hours a day, and so they need autonomous solutions. This is a yard truck that works at some of the major distribution centers in the world, and they too can't get the labor. In rush seasons at Amazon, they have to have the accounting staff come out and help move things around to ship. The same goes for farming, that farmers cannot get their children to stay on the farms anymore. The country is growing, the world population is growing, and we've got to get better at making food. And the same with security, with human rescue, which this robot is for, we call it chaos, it's doing a little swim in the snow. So those are some of the things that we do, and it's really to help with this significant labor shortage because we just can't get the people to do it or we can't get to these rough remote places that people just don't want to stay because the conditions are so harsh. As I said, coming to UFM, my mind was blown and I took many, many pictures. This was a profound statement that was interpreted for me. And it says along this walkway, it is not the answers that make us grow, but the questions. And I want to share today some of the questions that have made all the difference in my life and in my career. I love this meme. It talks about some of the typical relationships between boss and their employees. A boss arrived at work in a brand new Ferrari. I said, wow, that's an amazing car. He replied, if you work hard, put all your hours in and strive for excellence. I'll get another one next year. So does that feel right? Is that ethical to have luxury on the backs of your workers? And what ultimately will lead to the ideal outcome as you think about that worker and what he's working towards? I agree with Richard Branson who talked about the priority order that is optimal, that if we put our people first, then our outcomes should take care of themselves. If we put people first, they will take care of the customer and the customer's purchases and support will ultimately take care of those investors and shareholders. My favorite question that has changed my journey came from Robert Greenleaf, who was the father of servant leadership. And he said in his question testing whether we're truly that kind of a servant leader that changes that kind of paradigm that we just talked about with the Ferrari guy. And he said, do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to be servants? That is a profound question. And I'm gonna break that down and talk through that today. So healthier, I've had employees say, whoa, that's not your responsibility. Stay out of my health. Or that's not your responsibility, don't worry about it. As I have studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it has become more profound over the years. And it talks about the different needs from the physiological, which is our need for food, for shelter, up to the safety needs of employment, having a job you can count on, to loving and being valued. And then up to esteem where you get that recognition and status and you're given freedom, that autonomy. 
and our need for that, and then ultimately self-actualization, where we can pursue the need of the desire to become the most that one can be, reaching our potential. So where do you want your people functioning? What he taught is that you can't get to the self-actualization unless you've taken care of all of the other ones below it. And so as you think about someone who's struggling for oxygen, for food, for water, very hard for them to focus on reaching their potential. And the same with recognition. If they're so worried about their reputation and how people are talking about them, that they're consumed with that pursuit and that they really can't focus where you want them to be, which is becoming better, being better at what they do, providing more value, and ultimately helping your organization reach its potential. This chart blew me away as it shares that once we can get people there, that we can get them up to that focus on reaching their potential, growing and learning and becoming more, then the actual need intensity of all those others goes lower. And so as you think about that, people will be less offended. In hard times, you're going to be able to weather those hard times because they can go without as much income because they're invested in this higher purpose. Fascinating learnings there. And important as we consider the needs of our employees and what they're struggling with and where we want them to be. I need you focusing on value creation and becoming more when they are struggling with some of these other worries. I get this question asked a lot. How in this climate of rapidly changing technology can we make sure that we maintain and even grow when there is so much and it is moving so fast? And it's a valid question. We are exponentially growing in technology right now. And one of the examples that's brought up to me often is the chat GPT. And this is a chart that shares how they were able to go to 100 million users in two months. And as I have talked to people, for example, about Google, a month before this happened, I was being told nothing is going to topple Google. And within three months, they were saying they're done. Multi, multi-billion dollar organization. And because of the scale, because of the connectivity of the world, things can change dramatically. And so how do we as company management and leadership deal with that kind of rapid change? I believe that to thrive in the future, we need a team that isn't threatened by technology. They're not worried because as Richard Branson said, you're putting them first. And so you're not going to dump them the moment you can use ChatGPT to write their technical paper. You're going to retrain them. You're going to help them reach their potential. And just as the mining site is doing, they say we're never laying anyone off when we bring autonomy. We're retraining all the truck drivers and now they're operating our software and doing things with their brain instead of driving in a circle 16 hours a day. And as we do that, it's going to help us because this technology is moving so quickly that we have no idea how to apply it to all of the roles in our organization. We have no idea all of the ways that ChatGPT, as an example, could help us be more effective. And if you have everyone in the organization who is comfortable with their place because they know they're number one in your mind, then they're going to be bringing those ideas. They're going to be out there studying and learning with you in how to grow the organization. So, free or more autonomous. This is my favorite, maybe because of the name. We do autonomy. We have all of these autonomous vehicles in a mine site. This is a 300 vehicle site and it's running at about a million dollars an hour. And so if my autonomous trucks stop, they get a little grumpy. And so we're trying to move iron ore through this mine at a million dollars an hour. And we need all these autonomous vehicles who can go do their thing to actually work together and optimize to get that iron ore flowing out at that optimal rate. And so just as we want our people to be autonomous, how do we get them all moving in the same direction? How do we give that autonomy and that freedom so that they can start working on their potential as Maslow suggested and yet all accomplish this orchestration? 
I believe Zig Ziglar had a hint here when he said that you can get anything in life that you want if you will help enough other people get what they want. And so if you're focused on helping your people, these people that you're giving autonomy to, help them get what they want, then you will ultimately get what you want. Our framework for doing that, and there's no rocket science here, but getting a mission that they believe in, getting a vision they're excited about is important. Getting values and principles that they resonate with, and then providing the structure, the framework, the tools that they need, and then ultimately that strategy and that plan. I'll share what we've come up with to date. So our mission, help you reach your potential through innovative robotic solutions. If our employees are reaching their potential, then our customers will reach their potential and ultimately the end users of the iron ore. And the vision, which really gets me excited, is that we want to make it a place where you want to work even when you financially won't have to. And that, that will accelerate the financial freedom for all the owners. Now that only works if you make everybody owners, which we have done. And so that bar where even if they're millionaires, they will want to come back into work the next morning, that they're treated in a way with respect, that they are covering and working on a challenge that excites them, that is the bar that we've set. And it's a high bar. And some of my employees laugh at me. But it is so vital that in every interaction, I want people to be thinking about this. When, when purchasing messes up an order that they were getting for you, do I go and interact with them in you better get this done or else, or am I gonna make it a place that they wanna to work tomorrow even if they were multimillionaires? And I ask how I can help. I ask if there was something I did wrong with the order number. How can I help you? And talk about that common goal that we have together. And then customer, we want to be excited about what we're doing for them, helping them out of the dull, dirty, dangerous. Again, it has been so profound to bring one of those truck drivers from Australia who's been driving in a circle for 12 hour shifts to our company and to have her share, and we quoted on video, her journey of being able to move from that kind of a role to be retrained, to use her mind, her creativity, and just soar in the business. That changes our employees' lives because they love that vision. And then values that people resonate with and principles. And as you think about giving people autonomy, these things are vital. If they all know where we're going, they all know what the desired future state looks like. If they know things like this, then they can make decisions that are within our approach and it will attract the people who think like we do. And I, this is profound. As you think about them being autonomous and then being in a decision-making situation, if they understand this and believe it, risk more than others think is safe, care more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical, expect more than others think is possible, that will guide them. Then they will think in the way we want them to with the right kinds of priorities, but bring their autonomy to the kinds of problems they're trying to solve. That is how we get autonomy as we give these kinds of guides. Then I don't have to be there, hey, you're not treating that person right. Hey, you're not taking the risks that we need you to take to be successful. I was asked last night, how do you measure whether this is actually working, this pipe dream you're establishing with this bar of a place that you'd want to work even when you financially don't have to, and this belief that it will lead to the ultimate results? We're trying to measure it in any way possible. Every quarter we do an anonymous survey and ask our people, how are we doing? The most important one being this one, which is, is our leadership humble? Are they listening to you? Are they taking your feedback and acting on it? And I'm happy to say that those results are our highest score of all of the values that we measure. And how cool it is that the people with the lowest scores who are furious about me doing this anonymously are no longer at the company. So how do we get them to push for these results? Because making it a place you want to work even when you financially don't have to that doesn't get the return so you can keep paying them and feeding them isn't very sustainable. So how do you do that? I often say, what would Dale do? Uh, I love Dale Carnegie and what he taught. I really brought those principles from the Bible and wrote this book on influence, which really is the best book that I believe exists in how to work with others. I need to read it every year. It is so profound. And so what would Dale do? His question 
is how can I make this person want to do it? So we've got these people with autonomy. How do we align? How do we get them excited about getting the results that can keep making payroll and ultimately thrill the customer? And I don't think this is the innovation you thought I was going to be talking about today, but how do we do that? That takes innovation. That takes creativity. How do we get them to think like owners and make decisions that are longer term versus a nine to five kind of mindset? How do we reduce their frustration with leadership of us versus them between departments, between leadership and the people doing most of the work? Well, first, as I mentioned, we make them owners. So everyone in our company owns shares in the company. We ask them what's important to them. And then we rank those things. So with our discretionary money, what do you want as an owner for us to use that money for? What do you care about? Is it Healthcare and dental, you want better healthcare? Do you want more time off? Do you want more of a cash bonus? Training budget, research and development, you want to invest more in the next product to help really launch our company? Or hackathon, every other Tuesday we do a hackathon where the employees get so many hours where they get to work on their own robot project that they want to do. And where do you want? So they've ranked them, they've told us what they want, and then we tie a formula to that. And so they know that as we project and talk in our dashboards about our profit, they know exactly how much is going into the IR&D bucket and the training budget for them to have classes they want, for the time off on the holidays, the, the retirement. And so it's no longer, man, HR doesn't care about us. No, there just isn't money. We care, we wanna give you better, better healthcare, but it's not there. And so now we distribute this so that everyone has that autonomy to help. And then most importantly, we've got to help them understand what their role is, how important it is to get these results, what you do as the accounting person, as the electrical engineer, as the production manager, how do you contribute to the gross profit that will help you get what you want? And so as we think about that, we have to put a framework of goals and plan in place so that we can make sure that there's that alignment. And everyone has to be involved in the development of that or you don't get the responsibility. And I love this football analogy. Intel uses it as they introduce their goal setting framework in their organization and it's the American football. So you can see at the top something like win the Super Bowl. That's where we're trying to go as an organization. Now when you talk to that kicking coach, no one knows more about kicking than him. And so if you're driving his goals, you're not gonna get the right answers. So he's got to bring his autonomy, what he knows about goal kicking and how you're going to measure the performance there. And he's looking at, well, we're trying to win a Super Bowl. I bring my knowledge. I set goals that I can buy into and have responsibility for. And then we have that alignment throughout the organization. And so this is an example of our company. Last quarter, it was at the highest level, align, relentlessly improve and ship. And then there's measurables for each of those. And that is full transparency. So everyone who's a manager in the company has these three goals. They can be, as I said, that kicking goal, that kicking coach knows exactly what makes sense for the kicking coach to have as a goal that can help support the goals of the organization. And I can go in, anyone can go in and see if I'm walking my talk. I have three goals that I am doing based on my expertise and my role and where we're trying to go as an organization. Anyone can go in and look at anybody else's and see how they're doing, how it's progressing, how aligned is it with where we're going. And this quarter, my grade is not gonna be good. Uh, and so everyone can see that. Is Mel truly walking his talk? Is he moving the ball forward? Is he avoiding the distractions, saying no to the non-important urgent kinds of things that come up in my role and really working on the most important. Bottom down, bottom up, top down is the phrase Intel uses. I like more side to side as I arrange this. Uh, who knows what the top and bottom is? But you've got to make sure that that kicking coach has the autonomy and so we can have the responsibility for what he's bringing to the table. And then want to, how do we want to? We have a ship here which drives gross profit and we're able on our dashboard for everyone to see if we ship this amount of mining trucks, 
this is the kind of training budget I'm going to have because I care about that, or this is how much retirement or whatever they care about. And then everyone also has a learning OKR, objective and key results. So everyone has a learning one of these where I can go in and see how they're doing on what their goal is for reaching their potential. And they meet with their managers one-on-one -on -one every month to talk about how they're progressing on their career goal to learn. I am pushing right now, please be studying AI, please be understanding, because I'm not gonna replace you as a programmer, I need you to be the most optimal programmer in the world. Wiser. Oprah shared this profound thought that we need to turn our wounds into wisdom. We were doing really well in 2007, and we were growing exponentially. Robots were in demand, and then the global recession hit. Not good. And as you see, we dropped easily to a third of our revenue, and we were in dire straits, and our chief financial officer saw the writing on the wall, and he said, I've got to leave. It's not good. And so he packed up his bags and got in his car and then drove past my son, Wayne, who was on his way to his death. And he had suffered from depression and was bullied at school that day and died in a police chase that night. And so as you think about turning wounds into wisdom, how do I navigate that? And it was quite a journey. We were able to use his life insurance for the next payroll, the car insurance for the next payroll. It took a year for us to be able to afford his tombstone. But in turning to our Savior Jesus Christ, we were to have, able to have incredible healing and blessed with the increased faith with the courage that assured eight years later when we faced an incredible challenge that we could have only gotten through and not given up and quit because of that faith that we had through this journey. And as a company, we employed things to improve our company. Ford uses something called an 8D, and that's a process they use when wounds happen in their organization, when something goes wrong with their vehicles and they need to have a recall. When something happens you don't ever want to happen again, they have a process to navigate that. And AD, eight questions basically, that they ask, what's the right team to help us turn this wound into something that makes our company better? What is the root cause of this? Even asking the five whys over and over and over again. Ultimately, how do we improve our company and implement the processes so that we are better? That we will look back at this setback as critical for the growth that we needed to be a better company, to have better results. And as I say here, respond to these challenges so that we can look back and believe that we would have volunteered for it because of how good we became through that. I love, as I've walked around this campus, to see the new theme around responsibility. And Jocko Willing teaches in Extreme Ownership that we need to do more than just take responsibility for ourselves. As an organization, we need to take extreme ownership responsibility for everything. And you will have an optimal team if you have everyone saying, here's what I could have done to avoid that. Here is how I could have helped. And that transforms your organization instead of whose fault is it, who's to blame, that you have everyone raising their hand and saying, here's how I could have helped. And who do you want on your team? You want someone thinking, I could have done this. This is something... I I could have, obviously not my fault. Uh, Jocko shares the example of friendly fire where they killed one of their own people. The guys who without, did not have the gun and didn't fire the shots were putting up their hand and saying, here's what I could have done. I could have helped with the radios. I could have clarified the mission. I could have, that's what you want in an organization. That's how you optimize the results of an organization. And because of the responsibility theme around the university, I added this quote, which I love, from Stephen Covey, that talks about the ultimate power, the ultimate ability to choose your future is to take that responsibility. Until a person can deeply and honestly say, I am what I am today because of the choices yes I made yesterday, that person cannot say I choose otherwise. If you're a victim of all the things that happened to you, 
the recall on that Ford, that Ford vehicle, how can you be the leader to take that organization to the next level if you're the victim of every bad thing that happens? But if you can turn those things into making you a better company, if you could put up your hand and say, here's how I could have helped, that's when you optimize, that's when you can choose your future and make it what you want to make it. And then the final one, how do you help your people to be more likely to become servants? First, we need to model it. We truly need to put our people first. We need to show them that that can generate the best results. And as Arthur Brooks shared, that if our people see someone who's putting other needs ahead of their own, they will want to follow that person. And he's, he has shown it. He's had some amazing talks and data that share and have done experiments around who chooses, who do people choose as a leader? And 82% will always choose someone who is more of a servant leader. They will follow them into the fire compared to the other people because they know they're going to put me first. They're going to take care of me. They do put others first. So I want to end with a little plug for some heroes of mine. They're here today from Beeline Wheelchairs. We came down a month or two ago and made the unfortunate decision to go on a day when my friend Mark and Esther were fitting people, children, with their new wheelchairs. And the mothers were crying, I was crying, my team was crying, as they have made it their mission in life to help children and to give them chairs for free, just like in America where they have life insurance and health insurance that covers these kinds of things. And they've made that their, their life quest. And so we've decided uh, as our team of entrepreneurs, we have a Innova Guatemala team that is trying to fulfill our quest that surely these free market systems and innovation and entrepreneurship should be able to solve these problems. Unfortunately, the Americans aren't very consistent in our performance economically, that we aren't very consistent in getting Mark and Esther the money they need. And so we want to use those principles and work with U.S. and Guatemalan companies and create products with the same parts that they make their wheelchairs out of and sell those into Guatemala. And so that's our quest. That's now what our company's team that's coming down year, year after year will bring executives down and work with UFM and their students to help launch these products and try, no, we will succeed in helping Mark and Esther in their ministry of blessing the children of this country. So in summary, please put people first, bet on your people, help them be healthier, freer, more autonomous, wiser, and more likely to be servants. Thank you.